Other types of maps, that, uh, thematic maps, that show quantitative information are graduated symbol maps. So here we're looking at California counties again. And we're showing uh, population by county. Here we're looking at total numbers. So you could have shown this information uh, as we did with the choropleth map where every county would be uh, color along some gradient. But in this case, instead of using colors for each county as a whole, we have these circles where the size of the circle indicates the relative size of the population. But it also uses coloration for the circles to kind of reemphasize the point as well. And so you do get the sense of where the populations are higher or lower. And you also get a little bit of sense of the density, at least regionally. We can see that uh, Los Angeles County dominates here amongst the surrounding counties. And then we look over here in the Bay Area around San Francisco, we see that there's no single largest county, but there's a lot of highly populated counties around it. Another type of graduated symbol map, here we're looking at earthquakes that have happened around the world over the last 200 years. So the larger the circle, the, the more people died from that particular earthquake. And we see that a lot of those earthquakes happened through the Middle East in Asia, and particularly along the Pacific Rim, Rim although it's particularly hard to tell here because the, the uh, particular map projection that we're using splits the Pacific Ocean in two, so you can't really see that. In any case, the point here is to communicate both the magnitude differences amongst those earthquakes as well as their distribution. Another type of thematic map that you may have seen if you've looked at or watched closely at uh, weather reports on TV or online are these uh, weather charts. This one is showing pressure differences across the continental U.S. And this is what's known as an isoline map. The significance here is looking at the lines which connects points of equal air pressure. Okay. So the, the information here is communicated by the distribution and the shape of the lines as well as their values. And the way that you read them is you have to interpret what the value of that particular line is. And in the case of a, of a pressure map looking at across the earth, uh, across the continent rather, uh, if you know a little bit about weather and climate, you know that where those pressure lines become concentrated like that, you get a strong pressure gradient and you're probably getting very high winds in that area. So there's a lot of information packed into this map, even though it might look a little confusing. Uh, and ISO, ISO lines are actually a very popular way of communicating information on a map. In fact, the contours that are on a topographic map are, in fact, a kind of an ISO line um, that communicates information, again, by connecting points of equal value. A less common but more artistic map is something like this, called a flow map. And this one is interesting because, well, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, it's not something can, that, be, that can be created automatically on the computer. It actually has to be constructed um, somewhat manually. It can be done, but it takes a little more work and creativity to give it a nice polished look. This particular map is showing the migration across the continental U.S. since the late 17th or 18th century. And you can tell on this map um, where the largest movements were by the thickness of the arrows as well as being able to determine the direction and something a little bit about the route as well. What's kind of profound about this kind of map is that unlike a lot of the other maps, it's actually kind of dynamic in the sense that it shows movement across time, uh, even though it's a static map. This is one of the biggest problems with most maps is that they're, they're static snapshots of one moment in time. And a flow map kind of gets at that idea of, of movement, of the change over time. It isn't until we've had access to more advanced digital tools that were beginning to incorporate the temporal dimension of map data. But this is kind of a, a, a starting point for thinking about how you might do that. Um, another type of flow map, and this is a lot more modern, is a map showing the movement of data across the internet. There's actually been a lot of uh, effort to try to track how data moves across the globe and particularly through our internet infrastructure since that, that is becoming the primary way that information moves around the world and increasingly the way a lot of money does. So all of these are, are really uh, different ways of using maps with different purposes in mind and different modes of symbology, of symbolizing and showing information. So you have two basic categories that you pay attention, pay attention to. The topographic map, which shows the physical features of the earth, that shows the shape of the land, and then these thematic maps, which are generally less concerned 
with uh, the shape of the land and more concerned with showing some kind of a theme, some kind of a topic, and communicating that in a variety of ways, either through the choropleth or the dot density or the graduated symbol or the flow map, a lot of different ways to do that. Of course, the world is not quite that simple, and there are other hybrid uh, models of showing m information that even deviate from those. One of the more fun ones, I think, is a cartogram. And a cartogram substitutes some other value for space or size. So in this one, we're looking at population change and population size across the U.S. between 1990 and 2000. And what we've done here is instead of using the physical size of the states in order to map them, instead we're using their population sizes as a way of mapping them. So in this case, every little square that makes up one of these states represents a certain number of people. Well, depending on the number of people in that state, that's how many squares you get. So what we see is the relative size of the states is not determined by their physical size, but rather by their population size. And it should be pretty striking when you take a look across the country to the northeast, Massachusetts, which is a really tiny state physically, looms pretty large here because it has a pretty sizable population, particularly in comparison to the rest of the country. Cartograms are really popular ways of showing information because they still give you the familiar sense of where things are, For again, looking at the U.S., but they give you a different sense of the information that you're looking at, in this case, looking at election results, to give an overall sense of, of influence or the relative magnitude so that we're not misled by comparing states of very different sizes uh, whose influence is really not determined by their physical size. It's rather determined, say, by their population size or their electorate size. Uh, this world population cartogram is a particularly popular one because it really gives you a sense of where most of humanity is, showing the distribution or the size of the countries here is controlled by the size of their populations. And so you can see that China and India are enormous. And you probably already knew that. But when you look at other countries, like Russia, for example, Russia is uh, the largest country on Earth. And yet here, it's just pushed to the margins because population-wise it's absolutely tiny. Other countries like Japan, for example, although an island and relatively small, it looms large here as well because of the large population there. Cartogram of global carbon dioxide emissions. This was a, a popular one that passed around for a while too because it really showed in the debates about carbon dioxide and about climate change legislation and treaties that were trying to be worked out at the time about who bore most of the responsibility and where that effort should be put. And a lot of countries that were in the developing world uh, were not so industrialized, argued that really it was the US and Europe in particular who bore a lot of the responsibility because that's where most of the emissions were coming from. But by the same turn, the US and Europe argued that China, although a developing nation technically, was rapidly catching up with the rest of those countries and also represented a major threat to the rest of the planet. Uh, but the important point here is simply that this kind of map aided different kinds of arguments to be made about what exactly is going on in the world. So the map is not intended to distort. The map is actually intended to communicate the information in ways that might not otherwise be so obvious. And again, maps can increasingly deviate from reality. This is technically not a map. It's, it's, a, it's a diagram, a physiographic diagram. Uh, in this case, you get the sense of where things are, and you can see some reference to physical features in the landscape like mountain ranges. Uh, the problem here is that it's not planimetrically correct, which is simply to say that the way that the mountains are drawn, for, mountains are drawn, for example, um, if you were to try to measure things on this map, they would come out wrong because the way that the mountains are depicted in particular they actually extend across planimetric space, even though the point of drawing them the way they is, they kind of give the illusion that they have some kind of height to them. But again, that kind of confuses things. If you put a ruler to this map and tried to measure out, say, the distance between any two mountains, it would be very distorted because again, that's not the purpose of this kind of map. It's rather to give a sense of where things are and the relative lay of the land. And then, of course, now the reality with a lot of data that we work with in maps is that we're uh, working less and less with these kind of cartoonish drawn maps in a sense and working increasingly with a lot of remote sensing data which we'll get into later and here we're looking at um, air photos uh, or air, I should say aerial imagery or possibly satellite imagery uh, 
that has been georectified so that it sits correctly in space, which allows us to then overlay, you can see this road here that's colored red, GIS information on top of it seamlessly, so that our maps increasingly are pretty much a composite of remote sensing imagery as well as other kinds of GIS data. And so we see that a lot when we're, we're increasingly getting access to new and powerful sources of information that really allow us to map the world in increasingly precise and new ways and let us see more information a lot faster than was ever possible before. And so we can bring together a lot of sources of information into the modern map. So this week we'll be looking at different kinds of maps and trying to construct a few of our own.